Perhaps they were just deceived. Yes, this term accurately describes them. A complete deception. But despite this, it doesn't matter at all. I could have gone into a thorough analysis, but in the end, every event unfolded because of a choice. And in the end, it was our choice that mattered. She made a decision, and so did my friend. The difficulty arose because their choice did not match mine. After learning the truth from a reliable source closely related to the situation, I decided to make a new decision. I made the decision to unleash chaos. The place that I used to call home, I can no longer consider our common space. It was a modest three-level house with a two-car garage, located in a cozy middle-class neighborhood. My name is Tyson Peterson, and I hold the rank of sergeant in the Red River Falls Police Department. Technically, I was supposed to be on duty that night, doing my usual shift from 3 p.m. to 11.30 p.m., which I quite liked. My lieutenant, Rich Stryker, was a really cool person. But our boss, Captain Pete Sturgeon, remained a mystery most of the time. He can be quite unpleasant at times. But Rich was absent from work today, and I had no choice but to inform the captain about the problem I had. To my surprise, Captain Sturgeon was sympathetic and advised me to take the rest of my shift off. He also asked me to let him know as soon as my problem was resolved. So, I waited patiently ready to confront a few people who were in for a rude awakening. The only thing that bothered me was whether I could maintain control and not overstep the bounds of what was allowed. Suddenly, the sound of keys being inserted into the lock of the front door caught my attention. In an instant, a man and a woman clumsily stumbled into the room, clearly under the influence of alcohol, and their laughter echoed through the air. It's so dark in here, my wife exclaimed her voice full of surprise. The lighting timers should have been triggered, shouldn't they? She asked. Ignoring her concern, the man replied, It doesn't matter. We won't need lights for what we have planned. When they embraced, their figures merged into one, immersed in passionate kisses. Although this only confirmed what I had already guessed, a wave of nausea swept through me. Oh my God. You can't even imagine how much I'm looking forward to my annual trip to Red River Falls, Martin Parker exclaimed. Marty, a former close friend of mine, lived in Brainerd, Minnesota, with his wife, Marsha. For ten years, Marty, Marsha, Lisa, and I had a strong friendship. How Lisa and Marty could betray us in this way made me wonder. And yet here we were, face to face in my own house, just a few feet apart. I share your excitement, Marty. But weren't we supposed to meet at your hotel? Tyson has to come home at 11.30 p.m., so we have very little time left. I'm staying here for three days, Lisa, but I assure you that over the next two nights I will atone for my guilt to you. Lisa replied, Better not, and pulled him to her for a passionate kiss. But before we start, I'll get another glass of wine from the kitchen. Taking off her high-heeled shoes, Lisa asked, Do you want to? Marty replied, I want you to go upstairs to the bedroom and put on the luxurious underwear that I bought you. I'll get the wine. Just let me know where it is, dear. You're quite effective, aren't you? I have succeeded by staying focused, except when I come to you. Marty was absolutely unbearable. Okay, give me a few minutes and I'll call you. Please don't delay the wine. No way. And again, my mood dropped. My wife has never been so impatient with intimacy. It was a rare pleasure that I rarely enjoyed. But the way he or she talked about it gave the impression that she would do anything for Marty. I've always heard that this is the real betrayal in a love relationship. When your spouse does something for her lover that she won't do for you. Marty stumbled towards the kitchen, groping for the light switch on the way. At that time, I was standing in the corner of the adjacent dining room, staying away from the aisle, but I could still watch him make his way to the kitchen. After a long search, he found a refrigerator and took out a bottle of perfectly chilled wine. It struck me that I hadn't bought any wine lately, which indicated that Lisa must have been preparing for tonight, just as my informant had said. Marty left the refrigerator door ajar, lighting up the kitchen while he diligently searched for glasses. Finally, he called out, 
Lisa, where are the glasses? Her reply echoed through the house. In the top cupboard, to the right of the dishwasher. Marty obediently took a bottle of wine and deftly found a corkscrew lying in a specially designated drawer for him. Picking up a couple of glasses of wine, he returned to the living room and headed for the stairs. At that time, Lisa came out of the upper floor and went down the stairs to the living room. The light from the hallway illuminated her figure, causing a surge of melancholy in me. She looked absolutely amazing stockings, garters, and a semi-transparent top. Normally, anyone would find her heavenly or breathtaking, riveting the attention of 99 out of 100 men. But this was not the case for me. The sight of her in that outfit just awakened my primal instincts. While Marty stood with his hands full, admiring the view of Lisa, I deftly positioned myself behind him. With a quick movement, I reached behind the china cabinet, and activated a hidden switch that instantly flooded the entire living room with light. The sudden attack on their night vision scared both Marty and Lisa. It was at this moment that Lisa became aware of my presence and let out a piercing scream. At this time, Marty, still under the influence of alcohol, awkwardly turned around to see what was going on. Taking advantage of the opportunity, I swiftly brought down the full force of my collapsible baton on his left leg, just below the kneecap. Marty collapsed to the ground, completely taken aback by my unexpected attack. The shock was so intense that he couldn't even scream or scream in pain. He barely had time to realize that I had struck him. With a strong push, I forced him to lie on his stomach, treating him like any other suspect I had to detain and teach a lesson. Lisa's screams could be heard amidst the chaos. Lisa, please, I need you to calm down, I shouted, trying to regain control of the situation. If you don't stop screaming right now, the consequences could be serious. I promise, I will hit you in the face so hard that you will feel dizzy for a long time. Do you understand me? Surprisingly, Lisa immediately stopped screaming and just nodded. She was very scared and trembling uncontrollably. Suddenly, she felt the need to be modest and quickly covered her intimate area with trembling hands. Marty tried to roll over, still suffering from knee pain. Tyson? Is it really you? Oh my god! I hit him in the face several times, causing his nose to break. Lisa begged me to stop, fearing for his life. Ignoring her, I stood over Marty and watched him try to breathe. His nose and several teeth were badly damaged, but the bleeding was not life-threatening. But it was clear that we would have to clean the carpet as soon as this ordeal was over. Lisa begged me to stop. Please, Tyson, stop it already. Let me determine for myself when things have gone too far. Tyson, I swear it's not what you think. Come on, Lisa. Are you seriously going to use that hackneyed excuse right now? I couldn't believe Lisa's attempt to downplay the situation. How do you think I can believe that everything is not as it seems? How could I be here at this very moment if nothing was happening here? Lisa stood in horror, desperately trying to find a way to downplay the seriousness of the situation. But she had no choice. There was no way to erase or reduce what had been happening for the last three years. Three. Damn it. Years. Marty constantly planned his short three-day business trips to Red River Falls for the days when he knew I would be busy at work. He could only find out about my schedule through my beloved wife Lisa. Tyson, Marty said, trying to get up and spitting blood. It's not as serious as it seems, I swear. It's just a harmless fantasy. Nonsense, Marty, I replied. Both of you are far from convincing. You both have to admit that I know the full truth and nothing more. I already knew about the events that will happen tonight, as well as the events of the last three years. No, Ty. It's not what you claim, my friend. I sincerely promise that this was the original occasion when we planned to meet. Without thinking, I slapped him hard in the face once more. Do you really like being punched in the fucking face, Marty? Because every time I catch even the slightest hint of a lie or some other nonsense spewing out of your mouth, there will be a blow. Do you understand my words? Marty just gave up, raising his hands in defeat, barely catching his breath and enduring the agony caused by my attack. 
You're both lucky that I put my gun in the safe. I had a strong desire to shoot you both in the legs for your deceptive actions. Marty stuttered, asking, How... how much do you know? Maybe, Marty, you should ask a question about how much Marsha and I know. Marty remained motionless on the ground. He closed his eyes, realizing who had betrayed him. I have to admit, Marty, your wife deserves credit. She's obviously much wiser and not nearly as stupid as me. Somehow she managed to uncover your deceptive plans for a so-called business trip to Red River Falls, the very city where your close friends supposedly live. Marsha got suspicious and asked why you didn't say anything about this trip. It looks like she even looked at your schedule for last year and found that you made a similar trip to the same place back then. Marty, you didn't say a word about it. I mean not even once. It's useless to even try to explain because she saw through you and took action. It seems that you don't know much about phone security since she managed to find a person who was able to unlock your phone and discover almost 25,000 text messages that you exchanged with my wife for three years. For three whole years the two of you conspired to deceive and betray Marsha and me. For three long years you have been plotting to deceive and shame us. For the last three years, we have endured treatment that made us feel worthless, as if we were at the very bottom of the social hierarchy. No, Tyson, Marty interjected, disagreeing. It wasn't always like this. We never wanted to hurt anyone. He could hardly find the words. Lisa, tears streaming down her face, stammered. Marty's right, my love. We never meant to hurt or humiliate any of you. We never had that intention. It was just an uncontrollable attraction that we couldn't resist. I spread my arms out to the sides and menacingly approached my wife, still clutching the police baton in my hands. Lisa saw on my face an expression of deep hostility and disgust. She had never seen such a look before, and it sent goosebumps down her spine. Speaking in a low tone, I resolutely conveyed my thought to her, urging her never to address me as darling or any other affectionate word again. The fear in Lisa's eyes intensified. She stood trembling and silently agreed to my request. Moreover, I revealed to her the undeniable truth that she really harbors intentions to hurt and humiliate me. No, my dear, it's impossible to deny it. I can't believe it, Tyson. It is incredibly insulting to read a message from a wife in which she discusses intimate activities with her cheating lover and then casually mentions that she plans to kiss her husband without bothering to brush her teeth. It's as if she wants to keep the taste of her lover's presence on her lips, breath, and tongue while she humiliates her husband when he returns home from an incredibly risky job protecting the city and its inhabitants. Can you believe it? Lisa? Can you understand at least a little how this affects a man's emotions? To realize that your own wife respects you so little? Having been married for twelve long years, I was shocked by the shock and horror in Lisa's eyes. Tyson, how could this happen? She exclaimed and collapsed onto the stairs, choking on uncontrollable sobs. Marty, I growled, clenching my lips and teeth in pain. Don't protect her. You should know better. Marty, struggling through the pain, pleaded, Brother, don't blame her. It's my fault. You should be mad at me. Brother? I chuckled mockingly, disbelief rushing through me. Are you kidding? Did you seriously just call me brother? It's just mind-boggling. Let me rephrase the text message you sent to Lisa today, where you expressed your willingness to have an intimate relationship with her in our shared bed, calling her yours. I would like to remind you of how you even mentioned that you would like to take it one step further by doing similar activities on my side of the bed, forcing me to sleep in a mixture of your and Lisa's bodily fluids. Does that seem brotherly to you, you idiot? Marty just lay there, cowering and avoiding eye contact, overwhelmed with shame. But his shame was only caused by being caught in the act. I can't believe he was having an affair with his friend's wife. Lisa was crying, her voice full of regret. Tyson, I'm really sorry. I can't understand why those who are caught cheating suddenly start to repent. It surprises me how they, while indulging their selfish desires, 
do not think about the consequences and what harm they can do to their relationship. What should we do now, Ty? Marty stuttered, holding a handkerchief to his wounded face. I walked up and down the room for a while trying to collect my thoughts. Listen carefully, Marty, I said, a threat in my tone. I've been thinking about this situation in my mind. Can you get the gist of it? It seems to me that you came to Red River Falls three times solely on business, and all this time you were having an affair with my wife. If my calculations are correct, that makes three years and three business trips for a total of nine days. Does that seem accurate to you? Marty nodded, visibly worried and not understanding where I was going with this. Intrigued, I decided to continue. Apparently, during your nine-day stay, you had a daily relationship with my wife, as evidenced by more than 25,000 text messages. Based on this incontrovertible evidence, it can be assumed that you had an intimate relationship at least two to three times a day during your visit. Given the rarity of your annual visit, it's understandable that you took the opportunity to maximize the time you spent together. Moreover, judging by your text messages, you even bought Viagra to ensure a proper rest. Thus, it can be concluded that during each annual visit, you had a total of nine intimate contacts that lasted for three days, three sessions per day. From my point of view, you owe me 27 cruel blows for sleeping with my wife 27 times. Ty shook his head vigorously, denying the accusation. No, not that much, I swear to God. I kept my confidence by replying, Oh, I'm sure there were no fewer of them, Marty. Remember, I have all your text messages. Marty reluctantly replied, trying to show defiance. Okay, if you think beating me up will make amends, then you've cornered me. Please finish what you started, just finish the job. Oh, so you're suggesting that I just do you grave harm at this very moment? All in one action? Yes, I don't intend to return to this place anymore. Whether you come back here or not doesn't matter, Marty. I have a significant debt to you, and I will make sure that it is repaid by any means. Moreover, I can generously expand it to 27 quick punishments. I will reduce the number to two per day, and there will be 18 in total. This amendment is solely due to my kindness, Marty. Marty, overcome with despair and shame, looked away from me. The confident and cheerful businessman he was a few minutes ago, ready to enter into an illegal relationship with the wife of his so-called friend, has disappeared. Besides, Marty, I said coldly, you'll never be able to predict when I'll show up and run into you. I didn't know about your intentions to come to Red River Falls and sleep with my wife. You will never know about my appearance in this or that city, ready to face you and vent my rage on you. This statement took Marty by surprise. A mixture of shock and fear was reflected on his face, which was noticeable by the way he swallowed. You won't know when, where, or how I'm going to follow you, but rest assured, Marty, I'll find you. Make no mistake, I'll find you and you'll feel bad. Moreover, I intend to do it 18 times. If you want to fix your relationship with Marsha and the children, you must accept this fate meekly, showing real strength. I will not deprive you of your strength, since you still have responsibilities towards your family. But it is important for you to understand that you will experience pain and receive a clear message. Do you understand? Marty just sat there nodding. Now please get out of my house, you despicable, worthless liar. Moreover, I must warn you, Marty, that if I find out that you took out your displeasure on Makia, I will personally hunt you down and you will regret it. Is that clear? What's stopping me from reporting my actions to the authorities, Tyson? I have to warn you that it would be a huge mistake, Marty. And I emphasize the seriousness of the situation. It so happens that I am a police officer, and most of my colleagues do not treat those who engage in infidelity with the spouses of colleagues very favorably. These people are on a par with those disgusting individuals who betray the trust of the military abroad, risking their lives in the line of duty to protect our freedom. Let me warn you, Marty, that your actions will eventually lead to serious consequences. Marty just looked at me, and then turned his attention to Lisa, 
who was frozen in fear, sobbing softly on the landing. Leaving a bloody handprint on the door handle, he opened the front door and slowly walked towards his Lexus. A few minutes later the engine roared and he drove away. But that wasn't the last time I saw him. Instead I turned around and casually walked towards the stairs where Lisa was sitting. Her tear-stained face turned to me, and she exclaimed, Oh Tyson! Her voice trembled with sadness. What's going to happen to us? I'm so sorry! She pleaded, and sobs interrupted her words. Can you find the strength in your heart to forgive me? She desperately asked about our future, afraid of the unknown. I paused for a moment, trying to calm her down. Let me assure you, Lisa, I said softly. Nothing serious is going to happen to us, at least not yet. There was a glimmer of hope in her eyes when she heard my words, but I continued. There will be consequences, certain conditions will be set. You have to be ready to comply with them. This will entail certain consequences and conditions that you may disagree with. But if you really want to have any chance of saving our marriage, you have to abide by them. Do you understand that? Lisa readily nodded in agreement and wiped away her tears. First of all, I would like to thank you for your unwavering determination to never have children. I can only imagine what a huge impact it will have on us if we start a family. I understand that too, Lisa replied. I think I'm grateful for this aspect as well. Secondly, I continued, it seems that in your relationship with Marty, your penchant for adventure was much more pronounced than with me. There are a lot of experiences and things that you've done with Marty, but never with me. I'm sorry, Tyson, she said, lowering her head, and tears streamed down her face. I deeply regret this. I'm ready to do whatever you want, Tyson. I promise. Anything. Just tell me. First of all, you have to make an appointment at the clinic to get tested for sexually transmitted diseases. Neither you nor I know what Marty might have. If he cheats with you during business trips, chances are high that he cheats with other women as well. Obviously, you must completely sever all contact and ties with him. Lisa's surprise and shock were obvious, as she had not taken this aspect into account. Interestingly, many others, both women and men, believe that they are the only ones involved in their partner's infidelity. Moreover, it is important to recognize that the next aspect may be difficult for you. It seems fair to me that since you rejected me and prioritized your own satisfaction for the past three years, then I should reject you and pursue my own happiness. Darling, what do you want to say? I just promised you I wouldn't refuse you anything. I'm ready to do anything you ask. I swear, she begged. That's not the point. It's about rejection, infidelity, and keeping secrets. You should have gone and had fun. Now it's my turn to find my own pleasure. And as proof of your commitment to saving our marriage, you will help me in this. What would you like me to do? Lisa, I would appreciate it if you could help me find women and establish contact with them. I ask you to use any means to find these people and arrange meetings between them and me. It is very important that you inform them that you fully approve and support any actions or desires they may have towards me. I am open to exploring different experiences and ideas with them. After our meetings, I will return home with the taste of their kisses and their essence on my lips. Before I clean my mouth, I will definitely share a deep and passionate kiss with you. No, no, Tyson, she said in response. I categorically refuse this. I categorically do not wish to fulfill your request. Moreover, I don't want to share you with another woman. At the same time, it is necessary to understand that you will actually complete the task. If you refuse, I will not hesitate to inform the entire city of Red River Falls about your repeated infidelities, despite the fact that you were the wife of a loyal and honest police officer. I will make all text messages and correspondence between you and Marty available to the public. I will make sure that you become a social outcast in this city or in any other where you decide to find refuge if you leave me in Red River Falls. I will make sure that the memories of your involvement in Marty's affairs haunt you like an unpleasant smell in a confined space. 
Do you understand everything? Lisa stood motionless on the stairs, trembling, overcome with fear and sobbing. In the end, she timidly nodded in agreement. Very good. Now go upstairs, take off this offensive underwear and get into bed. I will occupy the guest bedroom indefinitely. Lisa carefully and reluctantly followed my instructions. Suddenly, a surge of anger seized me, and I impulsively hit the wall with force. Exactly one year has passed since that fateful night in our house. And since then, several interesting events have happened that have brought me to this very moment. Sitting in the living room, I waited anxiously for Lisa to return from the grocery store. After switching from a day shift to a day shift, I started working from 7 to 15.30 p.m. with less stress, unlike the previous shift. But it did allow me to be at home with Lisa more often, which made it possible to keep a closer eye on her affairs. Lisa, in turn, expressed her delight, believing that this allowed us to spend more time together. Despite the periodic contractions and moments of sexual scarcity, she sometimes complained, but immediately fell silent before I had to prove my superiority and remind her of the circumstances that led us to this moment. To her credit, she obediently followed my instructions. Lisa has created profiles on a website for married people looking for affairs and on several platforms. She was not aware of the identity of those who answered these questionnaires. Lisa's responsibilities included managing all communications with potential sexual partners, both on her own behalf and on behalf of my profile. I entrusted her with all the messaging duties, and she even took care of booking hotels for me when I went on dates. Despite this, I still kept in touch with Marcia. Given that they had three children, she made the decision to give the relationship with Marty another chance, and I couldn't blame her for that. I expressed my gratitude to Lisa for the fact that she and I do not have children, as this would significantly complicate an already difficult situation. Marcia provided me with detailed information about Marty's business travel schedule. I first encountered him in Hastings, Nebraska. He decided to stay in an inexpensive hotel, probably so as not to attract attention to himself. After he returned from the nearest bar, I managed to find him. Despite the fact that he was accompanied by clients and there were no women, I couldn't resist surprising him. I quickly pinned him against the wall and hit him hard in the face. My intention was to make Marty feel a lot of pain. In an attempt to remain anonymous, I hid my identity by wearing a ski mask and a hoodie. It was important for me to get the message to him so that he wouldn't know it was me. I couldn't risk attacking him with my bare fists, as it would undoubtedly lead to noticeable bruises if Marty decided to go to the authorities. To his credit, Marty withstood all the attacks without filing a single complaint. All these events have led to this very moment. I settled into an armchair and watched Lisa as she brought two bags of groceries into the house. She chatted animatedly on various topics, not meeting my gaze. It was obvious that she was trying to stay calm, resigned to the idea that I was dating other women, and was looking forward to the day when this stage would end and she would be able to return to the role of a devoted wife. When she finished picking up the groceries, I called her into the living room. She sat down on the sofa opposite my chair. I have something for you, I said, prompting her intrigued response. What is it? She asked when she saw the letter in her hand. It's been a whole year since, well, you know, I want to let you know that everything is finally coming to an end. Thank God, Tyson. If I had to witness you leaving for another rendezvous, I would be horrified to think that this is the end of me. Now you don't have to worry about it anymore. Does this mean that we can finally regain the intimacy that we once had, Tyson? But first I need you to read this letter, I said, handing her the letter. I am determined to become the most exceptional wife imaginable, I promise to fulfill your every wish, she said confidently. You'll see it firsthand. Just read the letter. I addressed Lisa in a solemn tone. An enthusiastic smile graced her face as she eagerly opened the envelope, believing that the worst was over and she could finally move forward. But the smile quickly faded as she delved into the contents of the first page. What? 
She screamed, jumping to her feet abruptly. What is this? A divorce petitions? Tyson, what is this all about? Are you kidding me? Lisa, this is not a joke. I want you to understand it's over between us today. I can't believe that you're really doing this to me, especially after all the effort I've put into building a relationship with you. Do you remember how I watched you leave this house and cried every minute, knowing that you were walking with those girls that I had to put a lot of effort into finding for you? And now you're telling me that you want to get a divorce. But let me be clear, Lisa. There were no dates. I have received messages from these people claiming that they had intimate meetings with you. I never had the opportunity to go on a date with any of the women mentioned, because in reality none of them were real. You seem confused, Tyson. Let me make it clear. I fabricated all the profiles of these women. Now you may wonder why I did this. Well, let me explain. Firstly, it is very rare for men who visit dating sites for married people to actually engage in extramarital affairs. In addition, the number of real women registering on these platforms is extremely limited, and most of the women's profiles are fraudulent. That's why I decided to create my own fake profiles that mirror the rest. Moreover, entering into intimate relationships with other women would not only put me on the same level as you, but would actually make me worse than you. Although you knowingly committed actions that harmed me, I understand that most of these actions were dictated by the temptation and pleasure of an affair, especially for Marty's sake. Thanks to therapy, I realized that you probably didn't intend to hurt me intentionally. But if I were to engage in intimacy with other women, it would be solely to hurt and get back at you. By and large, it would be much more detrimental. And that's where I ended up, so to speak, during these outings. In fact, as I understood it, I attended therapy sessions. You might ask why on earth would I do that? The reason was simple for you to demonstrate my unwavering devotion to me, to show that you are capable of fulfilling my requests. Well, Tyson, I can assure you that's exactly what I did. And because of my actions, this divorce seems even more mysterious. Lisa, I have made it clear that I absolutely do not want you and Marty to communicate or contact in the future. I assure you, Tyson, I have never seen him. I swear on my life. I understand your skepticism, but let me prove it. I installed a GPS tracker in your car as a precaution. You see, if you really want to convince me that you haven't met him, then this divorce seems irrational, unless you want to hurt him. But Lisa, if you haven't seen him physically, it doesn't mean you haven't received any messages from him. Tyson, I'm asking you to carefully examine my phone and computer. Look at everything. I guarantee you that I have not exchanged messages with him from any of the devices. I'm telling the truth, I promise. But please believe me, I have indeed discovered something disturbing. I have carefully checked both your smartphone and your computer. Moreover, I've discreetly installed a GPS tracker on your phone as well. Also, I found that Marty was missing, which is consistent with Marsha installing a GPS tracker on Marty's phone and car. So you're really right when you say you haven't seen Marty. Now I want to ask, why are you deliberately ignoring my request, Tyson? I have made it clear that I want you to stop communicating with Marty forever. Lisa noticed my concern, sensing that something was wrong. From my left pocket I took out a compact prepaid cellular communication device, disassembled to its simplest form. This model allows you to make calls and exchange text messages. You see, Lisa, my tech-savvy friend, once paid a visit and conducted a thorough scan of our house. To her surprise, she discovered a weak signal coming from your dressing room, namely from the outlet located in it. It turns out that you ingeniously screwed an additional outlet into the main outlet equipped with an outdated two-pin outlet. Finding the right outlet to charge your mobile phone can be a daunting task, especially if you don't have access to a three-pin outlet but you managed to cleverly hide it among all your shoeboxes and cluttered shelves in the closet. Lisa slowly sat down on the couch, realizing that our relationship was over. To top it all off, not only did you hide this secret mobile phone from me, but you also recorded only one program number on it. Do you want to guess whose number it is? Lisa couldn't bear the weight of her guilt, tears streaming down her face as she silently shook her head in shame. 
I specifically express the wish that you refrain from any communication with him. I was very worried that you would hurt him, she cried, overwhelmed with emotion. In the end, I really hurt him, and repeatedly. But your main concern should have been following my instructions to save our marriage. But you ignored it. This means that you no longer see the point in preserving our marriage, as evidenced by the divorce papers that you are holding in your hands now. I apologize, Tyson, for my earlier statement. Lisa, but I no longer hold the opinion that we are incompatible in this matter. Let's look at the situation from the other side. We are both relatively young, we are over 30, and we have the opportunity to do things that really bring us satisfaction. In my case, I've always wanted to have children, while you've never shared that feeling. Therefore, now I can look for a partner who either already has small children whom I can support and raise, or I can have my own children with her. No, Tyson, please understand that if having children is your desire, then I am ready to make this sacrifice for you. What? Are you kidding? You've never expressed a desire to have children before. If that were the case, we would already have one or two children, and we definitely won't have children just to save our marriage. That would be the stupidest and most irresponsible decision we could make. Trust me, this is the best choice for both of us. And besides, now you have the freedom to pursue Marty anywhere, anytime. Why do I need Marty? We've grown apart, and he's still married to Marcia. But it won't last long. If it's any consolation, although I doubt it will, Marty is getting the same divorce papers as you right now. Well, congratulations. Thanks to your actions with Marty, you managed to destroy not one, but two marriages. Lisa burst into tears, unable to control her emotions. Not knowing the future, I couldn't help but ask incredulously, Where are you going? What are you going to do? As for me, I have made it clear that I have no intention of leaving. After all, it's my hard-earned money that bought and paid for this house. If you work as a part-time librarian, earning a modest nine and a half dollars an hour, can you really afford to maintain this house? Let's be realistic. Instead, we can split our bank account, ensuring a fair distribution. You can keep ownership of your car, and I'll do the same with mine. I will also keep my pension. In addition, I plan to refinance the mortgage and allocate half of the capital to you. This will give you the opportunity to start your life from scratch and work wherever you want. Eventually, when you become financially well off, you will be able to purchase your own home. It is unpleasant to believe that this state of affairs is unfair, but I have to say that I deserve more than what is offered to me. Twelve years later, tears began to flow down her face. No, Lisa, it's not like that. You're entitled to a lot less. The only reason you get so much is because of my generosity. She hissed. Then I'll challenge it in court. I answered firmly. If you decide to fight me on this issue, you will not succeed, both metaphorically and literally, if you insist on a trial. I solemnly promise that I will not hesitate to inform the public about all cases of communication between you and Marty. I am fully prepared to bring Marcia, who will willingly testify in court, expressing all the pain and devastation that you have caused by your actions, branding you as a licentious and destructive person. In addition, I will make sure that your parents, brothers and sisters, as well as our nephews and nieces, watch the whole spectacle with amazement and disbelief. You will be symbolically, if not literally, marked with shame and shame. Is my intention clear to you? I will make you feel the urge to retreat into the deepest abyss in Mason County. You'll never want to see the light of day again. At that moment, a car horn sounded outside. Pack your things. Your sister Emily has come to pick you up. Take with you only what is required for a few days. The rest of the things can be picked up in due time, when we divide everything equally. I'll even arrange a day when I'm busy with work so that you don't have to run into me. Lisa tried to keep her composure and packed her things. Emily, her sister, with whom I have always had a good relationship, was the only one I trusted about this affair. At first, Emily had difficulty believing me, which was to be expected. 
but her disbelief quickly turned into shock when I presented her with the numerous text messages Lisa and Marty had exchanged. I asked her to keep this information strictly confidential, and stressed the importance that she not tell the rest of our family or parents about it. I explained this by saying that I want to gain an advantage during the upcoming divorce process. Fortunately, my risky move seemed to pay off. Half an hour later, Emily was helping Lisa load the last things into their cars. I couldn't help feeling sad watching Lisa leave the house for the last time as my wife. As I watched her drive away, I was overwhelmed by a mixture of emotions. The realization that I would have to accept a future without Lisa was frightening. But amid the sadness, there was a glimmer of hope. Deep down, I've always dreamed of having a family. And now I have the opportunity to make that dream come true. Lisa's departure gave her the freedom to search for what she thought she had found with Marty. Tears welled up in her eyes when she looked back at me, the man she once loved. And in that fleeting moment, I couldn't help but wonder what lay ahead for both of us. As she reflected on the home she had been forced to leave, the realization gradually came to her that she had left behind more than she could ever hope to return. One thing comforts me, namely that I know how she suffered and what pain she felt knowing that I go on dates and sleep with other women. Of course, I didn't get to that point, but she believed in it and it hurt her. Gentlemen, you have a truly fantastic story ahead of you, a story of adultery and the shocking consequences. This story is completely fictional, but reality is sometimes much more unpredictable than any fictional story. So let's hear the story. After a year of dating, we decided to take the next step and tie the knot. But our dreams of starting a family were shattered when we discovered that Jacinta had a disease called fallopian tube agenesis. She was born without fallopian tubes. The doctor explained that we could still have children through in vitro fertilization, IVF. But this news left Jacinta devastated, and she no longer wanted to have children. I supported her decision and for the next two decades I never brought up the subject again. Jacinta turned out to be the epitome of an ideal wife, always caring and diligently supporting our home, while at the same time taking care of my needs as a husband. Or so I thought. On a pleasant March morning, I decided to break my usual routine and not go to the airport at the usual time. Knowing that the flights were slightly behind schedule, I decided to postpone my departure. Jacinta had already gone to the bank, and I took my time getting breakfast and preparing for it. But just as I was about to leave, a wave of panic seized me. I realized that the car keys were nowhere to be found. I searched frantically for them, wondering if I had absentmindedly left them in another pair of trousers, or if Jacinta had accidentally washed them. Despite all my efforts, the keys remained unnoticed. There are times when you are desperately looking for something, but despite all your efforts, it remains elusive. I was one of those people that day. After going through my entire closet and all the drawers, I resorted to examining Jacinta's belongings. With great determination, I carefully combed through every item. It got to the point that I turned over the drawer. Suddenly, something caught my attention, something I shouldn't have stumbled upon. When I carefully picked up the fallen diary from the drawer, the used contraceptive slipped out from under its pages. It was obvious that this contraceptive had been used for a long time, as it now lay wrinkled and fragile. This discovery confused me, because in my entire life I have never resorted to such actions. I took out the diary and squeezed it tightly. Its contents promised to change the course of my life. The elegant handwriting belonged to Jacinta. As I absorbed the words, Tears welled up in my eyes, and a surge of anger swept over me. The scale of this discovery meant that my existence would change forever. Fear gripped me when I realized that my anger could lead me on the path of irreparable regrets. Trying to distract myself from painful thoughts, I set about tidying up the room, carefully putting everything back in its place. At the same time I came across my lost keys, abandoned in the car. 
This discovery caused an irresistible wave of disappointment, pushing me to the edge of sanity. Overcome with anger, I started the engine and rushed to my wife. Emotions overwhelmed me so much that I lost all sense of my surroundings and speed. Suddenly, a deafening explosion shattered the calm, plunging me into darkness. Gradually, consciousness returned, revealing a dazzling array of white lights. Have I entered the afterlife? After looking around the neighborhood, I came across a nurse dressed in a uniform. Are there nurses working in the heavenly realms too? Suddenly she gently touched my forehead and said, Wake up, darling. You've been sleeping for five days now. I stayed among the living. Damn it all. As the memories surfaced in my mind, I couldn't help but regret that I never regained consciousness. Jacinta soon entered the room. I was silent, watching her tears and expressions of gratitude to the higher powers for saving my life. But deep down, I harbored bitter thoughts about her. Then I was transferred to a larger room, joining five other patients who already occupied beds. I became the sixth patient. A few weeks later I was discharged and returned home. Although I regained my mobility and could move freely, I was looking forward to receiving insurance money that would allow me to buy a new car. A week has passed since that fateful Saturday morning. I was sitting at breakfast, leisurely sipping coffee and enthusiastically reading newspaper articles. Suddenly, an article caught my attention, which made me ask my wife, Have you ever heard of Jose Alvarez? It seems he works at your bank. Curious, she replied. And what is known about him? I told her the grim news. He was found dead last night. Cartel members may be involved in this. Realizing the gravity of the situation, she added, According to the police, it may also be the work of a jealous husband. Apparently, he had a lot of women, and it is possible that one of their husbands decided to take revenge. I noticed my wife sigh and leave the room. Smiling, I followed her to sort out the situation. Turning to my wife's diary, I found that a young man named Jose showered Jacinta with admiration, commenting on her appearance and impeccable grooming. According to her notes, she suspected Jose of excessive flirting, which raised concerns about his intentions to seduce her. But she reassured herself that this would never happen. Jacinta confessed in her diary that, as a woman in her 40s, such attention helped her feel young and desirable again, and she suddenly felt longing for such a revival in her life. In her diary, she wrote that she urgently needed to share her thoughts, unable to hold them back any longer. But it seemed impossible to confide in anyone, as some of her close friends boasted of flirting beyond the bounds of what was allowed. She always severely reproached them for even allowing the thought of reciprocity, knowing full well what chaos and disastrous consequences a messy divorce could lead to. As a result, she was unable to confide in her husband, and then she had to resort to the help of a diary. Deciding to take a cautious approach, she made a promise to herself to keep light-mindedness in her notes and make sure that things didn't go too far. She said I was incredibly boring and compared me to the monotonous staring at a photograph of an albino cow lost in a snowstorm. In addition, she mentioned that she hardly notices my absence during the Wednesday evening bowling game, which I recently joined. It seems that the lack of thrills in her life is driving her to the brink of insanity. I looked up from the diary and wondered aloud why she hadn't told me about her feelings earlier. I had no idea that things were so bad for her. It's time to come up with a few ideas to bring a little liveliness to our relationship. When I resumed reading, I moved from sympathy to melancholy. Furious and hurt, she began to justify herself by saying that a fleeting affair with Jose would bring a revival to her everyday existence. She had the audacity to claim that I would even benefit from it. As if that wasn't enough, she came up with a string of pathetic excuses, all of which were completely meaningless, to justify her destructive desires. In the end, she came to the conclusion that if she was extremely careful and kept absolute secrecy, she would be able to commit this vile act without any consequences. They cheated and arranged a meeting, looking forward to the thrill that they thought was waiting for them. 
She indulged in delusional fantasies about how everything would magically fall into place, as if betrayal itself harbored a vicious romantic attraction. Their ill-fated journey reached its climax when he brought her to a budget motel on the outskirts of the city. There was an unpleasant smell in the room, but the desire overcame all the inconveniences. But Jose turned out to be far from what she expected. He was rude and outspoken, destroying all her hopes for a tender meeting. He not only verbally abused her, but also made humiliating comments about me, and all this during their intimate act. Having completed his selfish desires, he callously dressed and abandoned her in that deserted room, leaving her alone to cope with her emotions. According to her record, she made a commitment never to let this man touch her again. She remained true to her words, rejecting Jose's offer of a new meeting. In her subsequent post, she admitted that the consequences of her betrayal were deserved and firmly vowed never to repeat such behavior. The realization of how much she could harm me with her actions deeply touched her. She made a sincere promise to turn over a new leaf and become a better wife for me, striving to improve in all aspects. The irony of fate is that she cheated on me, but I couldn't help but remember how kind she was to me after that. The woman who lied seemed to be trying to absolve herself of the blame. Maybe she learned a lesson, or maybe she didn't. When I approached my wife, she was sitting on the edge of our bed, holding a napkin in her hands. Judging by her reaction, I can assume that this was the man we were talking about. I didn't think you were particularly close to him. How well did you know him? I asked, subtly adding to her discomfort. He was just a colleague who worked for us for a while. He may not have been the nicest person in the office, but he certainly didn't deserve such a tragic fate. My thoughts were also with his wife and children, who undoubtedly did not deserve this. Based on the meaning of the article, it can be assumed that he had a reputation as a serial womanizer. The number of potential suspects is large, which makes it difficult to identify them. It is a pity that his wife and children had to survive such a father and husband like him. But now his wife has the opportunity to find a worthy partner who can truly take care of her, as I took care of you. When I said the phrase, a real man, she visibly flinched, which indicated that she understood what was behind it. Bending down, I kissed her gently on the cheek, and she continued to keep her head down, not meeting my gaze. When I left the house, a new spring appeared in my steps, bringing a feeling of happiness that I had not experienced for several weeks. Aunt Karma, what a nightmare. Another week passed, and another Saturday morning came. I was sitting at breakfast, immersed in the newspaper. As I was skimming through the pages, an article on the fourth page caught my attention. Curiosity got the better of me, and I couldn't resist reading it out loud. The headline sent chills down my spine. Man found dead on bridge. My eyes widened as I continued reading, learning the eerie details that followed. The article said that the man's body was found with an unimaginable act of cruelty. The article said that the victim was Ignacio Ayala, a 29-year-old man who had recently gone through a divorce. The mention of Ignacio's name had an alarming effect on my wife, who immediately rushed to the toilet, overcoming nausea. Worried, I finished my breakfast and quickly went to check on Jacinta. She remained sitting on the floor in front of the toilet while I handed her a wet washcloth. She took it from me and wiped her mouth. Did you use something last night that you didn't like? I asked. I think I'll be fine, she replied weakly. It's simple. It's just so terrible, she added, her voice full of anguish. Realizing that she had something to do with the deceased, I began to ask further. So you knew him, I stated. Referring to an article in the newspaper, I mentioned that he was known for his infidelity and that the authorities were concerned about the possible appearance of a pattern. They even interviewed his ex-wife, who claimed it was only a matter of time before a vengeful husband caught up with him, I informed her. He may have accumulated a long list of disgruntled husbands stalking him. It is possible that the authorities will simplify the investigation by revealing all the links between these two parties. By the way, have you worked with him in the past by any chance? 
Is there anyone among your acquaintances who could be romantically involved with both people? Perhaps it would be wise for you to report this to the police and... I had not finished my sentence when she abruptly interrupted me. Unfortunately, I don't know enough about any of them to determine their romantic relationship. I'm afraid I won't be able to help the police. I understood her predicament, but I couldn't help but wonder if even the slightest detail could help in catching the culprit. Perhaps there is a way to prevent the fatal end of another unfaithful husband. But perhaps this is not such a terrible outcome. Eliminating a few disgusting personalities can serve as a warning to others. Do you understand what I'm trying to convey to you, my dear? I am very sorry that I express such feelings. No one should suffer such a fate. Of course, you're not protecting these selfish and morally incompetent people, are you? If I had even suspected for a moment that these disgusting creatures had done you any harm, I can only say that they got off too easily. A smile played on my face. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not defending them in any way. It's just that the level of cruelty seems excessively excessive to me. If you're hinting that you would have subjected them to suffering in advance, then it genuinely scares me. I've never seen such cruelty in you before. In response, I said, and that's because no one has ever betrayed me like that. I sincerely hope that you will never have to experience the depths of suffering that this thought causes me. I have to go to work. Are you planning to join me? Will you take the day off? I'll come to my senses soon. I feel much better now. I pulled away and left. Ignacio Ayala, her new partner after the divorce, was charming and convincing. In her diary entries, she wrote about what she had done to recover from her infidelity and mentioned that she should distance herself from me before I began to suspect, since I had no idea about her actions. In early October, she mentioned him for the first time, describing how he made her feel young and attractive. More than once, he brought her flowers to put on the table. Aware of the possible rumors, she insisted on attributing these gestures to me. He didn't mind, because he thought she deserved attention no matter who sent the flowers. He was quite a clever man. In the end, she agreed to a one-night stand at his apartment. Conveniently located on Bleecker Street, she could slip away unnoticed for a short meeting without arousing suspicion. But this time he intended to have a longer affair, and therefore spared no effort to impress her. In his dimly lit bedroom, he carefully laid out rose petals on the bed to soft music and the flickering of candles. His approach to seduction was much more thoughtful than Jose's. Although she had previously stressed that their meeting happened once in a lifetime, this time her conviction seemed to waver, especially compared to their first intimate meeting. Surprisingly, she even called it making love, and not just a physical act, as it was with Jose. I was already feeling mixed anger and bewilderment about her decision to attract a second lover, but this particular situation really crossed all boundaries. She went on to say that what started as a short affair turned into a full-fledged romance, much to her regret. But she didn't regret the initial romance and the delightful emotions she experienced during their first meetings. It was only when he became possessive and fixated on a specific intimate aspect of their relationship that she began to doubt. She quipped, If I just provide a few intimate services and cook one of my famous meatloaf dinners, then everything will be fine this time. I almost overdid it already. Besides, I already have two lovers and he still doesn't notice. It's funny. She laughed mockingly at the love and trust I had shown her, and it deeply hurt me. The desire to get rid of the pain consumed me. It took almost the whole week until the following Friday evening, before Jacinta stopped casting secret glances at me. Perhaps she had convinced herself that the deaths of those two lecherous men were just a coincidence. Perhaps the second one was inspired by the first one. Saturday morning came, and with it our usual breakfast meeting. After the disturbing events of the last two Fridays, she was dreading this day. But I was looking forward to our meeting. As soon as I entered, she wasted no time in accusing me. You came home late again after going bowling. This has been happening for two, maybe three weeks in a row. 
Tell me, are you plotting something you shouldn't be doing? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Me? Am I doing something wrong? This is a joke. I am as frivolous a person as a white cow in a snowstorm. I couldn't help but wonder if she was aware of the irony of her words. But she still continued to cast puzzled glances at me while I casually flipped through the newspaper. When I unfolded the newspaper, my gaze immediately stopped at the disturbing image. It was a photograph taken at the scene of the crime, in which a police representative was desperately trying to assure the public that the perpetrator of this terrible act would be quickly apprehended. Looking through the accompanying article, I couldn't resist saying to Jacinta, He struck again. Undoubtedly, this is the same person they are talking about. This time, the unfortunate victim, identified as Sergio Barrera, was found by the lake, in a well-known place where couples often sought solitude near the marina. As I slowly lowered the newspaper, the look of horror on Jacinta's face reflected the feeling of anxiety that had gripped me. She let out a high-pitched scream and hurriedly headed for our bedroom. I couldn't help but smile smugly as I followed her. With the end of the second novel, her remorse seemed to wane, which led to a significant decrease in her attempts to make amends. Instead, her remarks mostly concerned the first meetings and her surprise that she had lost control of herself and deviated from the planned plan, which provided for only one date. As a result, the diary entries became scarce again until the end of March, when another young man paid attention to my devoted wife. Just ten days later, he successfully persuaded her to join him for a lunch date in his car. They parked in a secluded area known for its privacy and quickly finished their meal. After that, they began to kiss passionately, causing her to feel a sense of youthful delight. As their relationship developed, she became familiar with the art of reclining the passenger seat, allowing them to indulge in intimate moments right in the car. Although she experienced intense pleasure on two occasions, the added excitement of being caught intensified their encounters. Despite the fact that she tried to keep herself in control until the end of the working day, she could not get rid of the nagging fear that someone would find out about their secret date. On the way to work, she tried to study herself carefully. Whenever they met, she enthusiastically talked about her feelings of mind-blowing sensations. But she decided to end this affair when requests for two unpleasant things became too frequent. Naturally, after enjoying the meal, I followed her so that my breakfast would not be wasted. When I entered, she was able to recover from a crying fit. When she heard my presence, she raised her head, and I saw in her eyes an irresistible feeling of horror. Does she really think that I'm responsible for the deaths of her lovers and that she might be next? If that's the case, then I can't help but silently laugh at her absurdity. Judging by your reaction, it looks like you knew him too. Damn, you've already got three cases out of three. How come you know all these womanizers well enough to sympathize with them? Why? It was like a light bulb went on over my head and I pretended that I suddenly understood everything. Please assure me that you had nothing to do with these men. I can't understand how such a thing could even occur to you. What exactly are you accusing me of? Armando, I don't quite understand your intentions. It seemed to me that she moved into another state too quickly for it to be unplanned. I'm not accusing you, but it seemed completely random to me that you knew all three of these disgusting people. I was just making fun of you because I know that you value and respect me too much to jeopardize our wonderful years together for a fleeting moment of forbidden pleasure with these lying people. I was just struck by the fact that you know all three well enough to be upset about their deaths. It's not about them specifically, but about the severity and cruelty. Why didn't you react until I mentioned Sergio Barrera's name? Up to this point, you looked calm. It seems like this was a turning point for you. She looked away, showing that her emotions were running high. Deep down, I was desperately hoping that this time it would be a complete stranger. 
but when I found out that my company was dealing with his firm and I ran into him several times in the office, I probably couldn't put up with it anymore. Not that I had a close relationship with him, but the fact that it happened to a man I knew hurt me. I suppose this is understandable. Maybe I should get your opinion on this matter. Suspecting that I might have done this to them, she threatened, If you did all this, I won't hesitate to do the same to you. I looked into her eyes and calmed her down by gently kissing the top of her head. My dear, if I even suspected that you were involved with one man, let alone three, you wouldn't be sitting here and interrogating me. It's time for me to leave. Goodbye. I walked out of the room with a confident gait, knowing full well that her words pierced me even deeper and twisted the knife even more. The thought of her accusations amused me, and I couldn't help laughing on the way to work, replaying all this nonsense in my mind. That Friday night, Jacinta patiently waited for me to return from bowling, deciding to confront me. It was a little later than usual, although not as late as the near midnight arrivals over the past few weeks. But sleep was out of the question, as her nerves were very tense. This was understandable when you consider that her three previous lovers had tragically died in the last three Fridays, and each of them met their unfortunate fate near the place where they had intimacy with her. Even more worrisome was the fact that their deaths were somehow related to their personal styles, as evidenced by their lifeless bodies. When I walked through the door, Yacinda examined me with great care. I could smell beer on my breath but there was no blood on my clothes. Why are you still awake, darling? I asked. Do you usually sleep soundly already? Is something bothering you? Maybe you bought too many clothes this week? I asked. She denied excessive spending and attributed her discomfort to mild indigestion. Ten minutes later, she decided that I had fallen into a peaceful slumber, unaware of her secrets. She reflected on the irony of my expression innocence dream suspecting that i knew about her past adventures and assumed that i could actively seek out her former lovers on fridays despite the fact that i was supposed to have fun the question remained if these suspicions were true why hadn't i met her yet i wonder why he hasn't asked me to leave or insulted me yet it's as if there's a hidden side to him that only shows up to hurt and the rest of the time he's unaware of his existence it is unclear how he can switch between these personalities. He looks unchanged in his usual behavior. I'm sure he doesn't realize it. It's impossible for him to know and sleep peacefully at the same time. This knowledge would surely have exhausted him to the depths of his soul. I must continue to behave as usual and not show any signs of my anxiety. I have to be brave. She must have been thinking that way. Deciding to get some sleep, she rolled over on her back and closed her eyes. But as soon as she found a comfortable position, I began to fidget and almost incoherently mumble, expressing my dissatisfaction with a number of words. She opened her eyes in fright, realizing that now sleep would leave her for a while. Meanwhile, I was lying facing the other way, with a smug grin on my face. When Saturday morning came, I had a newspaper in my hands and I eagerly delved into the news of the day. Let's see what comes out this morning, I thought. I reached for the newspaper, making her anxiously wait for news about the next victim. Deep down, she knew that she was involved in another affair, and this increased her anxiety. As the tension increased, silence enveloped us, prolonging her expectation. Just when she started to believe that there had been no murders the previous night, I broke the silence. Well, it happened again. I finally spoke, prolonging the tension. Another man was found lifeless in his office. After asking what she thought about it, I asked, What conclusion did you draw? Her response reflected her confusion and denial. I have no idea. Why are you even asking me such a question? I know that your bank recently collaborated with his company, so I'm sure you've probably crossed paths with a man named Vicente Garcia. Upon hearing this news, Jacinda suddenly lost consciousness, gradually slid off her chair and collapsed on the floor. Watching her fall, a smug expression appeared on my face. 
Ignoring the situation, I calmly finished my breakfast, pretending that everything was in order. Casually stepping over her lame body, I grabbed the last piece of bacon. Memories flooded back to me, and I remembered another entry from Jacinta's diary, where she was anxiously wondering if she would meet her next romantic interest in the field of his company, which was funded by her bank. It turned out that she would eventually choose Vicente, the son of the boss and vice president of marketing at her company. Despite the fact that he was the oldest of her lovers at the ripe old age of 39, only eight years younger than herself, she explained how carefully she chose him. Unlike her previous partners, who were decades younger, she recognized his reputation as a flirt, but believed that they would be able to establish a mutually beneficial relationship. As a result, she was locked in the office. Vicente abruptly vacated his desk, sweeping away all the papers with one movement of his hand. What a romantic scene, straight out of a movie. Their meetings were frequent, but each week they set aside a special time for intimate moments, carefully arranging a meeting without interference. Before lunch, the entire office was at their disposal, creating the perfect setting. But after the fourth rendezvous, she didn't like his rush of variety. In the end, she expressed her displeasure and made it clear that if this happened again, their affair would have to end. He admitted that this was his favorite way, and they had to make a difficult decision. He often resorted to this method for his pleasure, making it clear that she must get used to him, otherwise he would reveal her secret to her husband. In response, she offered to inform his wife about their affair, which eventually led to its termination. She was thinking about the most memorable aspect of their relationship, the first romantic meeting, which she genuinely liked. Thinking about the possibility of experiencing more romance, she thought about having a series of one-night stands, maybe once a month. But she quickly discarded the idea, realizing the potential risk associated with their small town. If she had many lovers, the truth would become public and endanger her marriage, which she desperately wanted to avoid. Eventually, she got tired of these casual relationships. The day will come when she will long for my presence, so that I alone will look after her in her last years. She continued to pry, claiming that she was the perfect wife that I deserved. After all, she had four affairs that I didn't even know about. I no longer paid any attention to me, and she had no choice but to seek satisfaction elsewhere. Slowly recovering, Jacinta found herself on the kitchen floor. When she got up and sat down on a chair, her gaze fell on the newspaper, evoking memories of why she was there. Now she had four ex-lovers, and they were officially over. Worried, she wondered where I was and how long she had been unconscious. Did I just leave her and go to work? Such a thought suggested that I no longer cared about her and knew about her past adventures. Just as she was pondering these questions, I came into the kitchen with a wet washcloth in my hands and handed it to her. How long have I been gone? What is it? She asked. It looks like you managed to meet all four of his victims. It seems like an extraordinary coincidence, doesn't it, dear? But it's just a coincidence. Are you absolutely sure you don't have information that could help the authorities find the culprit? I asked teasingly, knowing that they would be very grateful for this. I really don't know anything, please just leave me alone. Calm down, I was just joking with you. If you can't handle a joke, it's going to be hard for you to tolerate me during our retirement. You need to put in some effort too. Saying goodbye to her, I gently stroked Jacinta's head, trying to calm her down a little. She had been visibly exhausted and on edge all week, her nerves easily shattered by the slightest noise, such as the sudden hum of the stove. Meanwhile, I behaved as if everything was going as usual, except for one essential detail. Our intimate life had stalled, having lost the usual initiation. When I went to the party on Friday night, Jacinta was probably thinking a lot. Could I have known about her infidelities? Her thoughts were whirling through her head. She knew perfectly well what a passionate nature we shared throughout all the years of our life together. The sudden ringing of her mobile phone interrupted her train of thought, and that was her current lover, Pancho Aguilar. 
Hi, beautiful, I can't wait for tonight, he said. Is he still ready to go bowling? She hesitated, not knowing if meeting him would be a wise decision. I have a feeling he might be hiding something, she replied cautiously. Maybe it's better to take a break for now? He reassured her by calling her paranoid, but offered a solution. Don't worry, my love. To calm you down, we'll let him go bowling first. As soon as he leaves, I'll pick you up and we'll follow him to the club unnoticed. As soon as he's inside, we'll go home as soon as possible and start the party. You know how much I want to be with you. I guess you're right, Pancho. I had similar thoughts. Her rational thinking was undermined by a sense of desire from how amazing he felt when he was intimate with him. This was their fifth meeting, which had begun, oddly enough, on the day he came across her diary, and there seemed to be no end in sight. The spark of romance had faded, but the feeling that Pancho was completely absorbing her surpassed all longing for lost romance. He usually leaves around 4.30, so try to be on the block by 9.30. I'm looking forward to it she added in a low tone. I'll be there. Honey, don't worry about anything. As soon as I see him leave, I'll take up a position at the end of your driveway. As soon as you get to the car, we can follow him unnoticed. We won't have to chase him for too long as he won't recognize my car. This is the plan. I'm looking forward to you coming back to where you belong, to me. I can't wait either. See you tonight. As planned, they followed me unnoticed until I entered the alley, completely oblivious to their presence. Taking up a position on the opposite side of the street, they waited patiently for several minutes, but I did not appear. They hurriedly headed back to our house. Hurry up, my love, she whispered seductively. I want to have intimacy with you in his own bed. This oblivious fool doesn't even know about our affair and it excites me to think that I can commit such an act under his nose without being caught. He doesn't understand anything at all. I always knew he was a fool to let a stunning beauty like you slip out of his hands. You deserve someone who appreciates your presence more than the time spent with friends at the bowling alley. The attraction between them was strong, as evidenced by how quickly they took off their clothes after entering the house. Ninety minutes later, Jacinta invited him to leave, and she went to the shower. But when she returned, she was horrified by the sight that opened up to her. Pancho was lying motionless in bed, and he was dead. There was a moment of silence in the room. Stunned, she lost consciousness. When she came to, she found herself lying on the bed. Please accept my belated introduction, as circumstances prevented me from doing so earlier. I am Rafael Cano, the older brother of Armando Cano. Speaking in a calm tone, he says that he saw his brother's condition during his stay in the hospital. Lying on the cot, he did not find out about Armando's identity hidden under the bandages. But there was clearly suffering in his eyes, although not related to physical suffering. I comforted him after the pain caused by your adventures. During our conversation I cautiously asked for additional details, for example, about his regular Friday night parties and how he discovered your diary. Curiosity got the better of me, and the next day, while you were both at work, I broke into your house. I took the opportunity to read your diary by creating a duplicate for my personal use. With the information contained in it, I set out to seek justice for those who believed that they could enter into an extramarital affair without consequences, thereby overshadowing the sacred union. And now I'm going to call the police, and you're going to confess to all the crimes. Jacinta was in a state of shock. She didn't understand what was going on, but just waved her head. Soon the police arrived, and so did I. Rafael said that he came to visit us, and when no one opened the door, he used a spare key, which, as usual, lay under the flower pot. And when he entered the house, he heard a strong thunderstorm, climbing to the top, he saw Jacinta and the dead Pancho next to her. Later, my wife admitted that she was the one who got rid of her lovers and was facing a life sentence. Have you ever thought about the mysteries of life? For example, how many angels can dance on a pin or how many stars exist in the vastness of heaven? I may not have the answers to these riddles, but I can shed light on another eternal question. 
How long does eternity last? This question torments many hearts, including mine. Unfortunately, the answer to it is not as encouraging as we would like. In my personal experience, eternity lasted only three weeks, five days, two hours, ten minutes, and fifty seconds, more or less. It seems that my naive belief in the eternal oath, until death do us part, was wrong. On Friday, June 15th at exactly 3.14 p.m., I was stunned when a deputy sheriff came to my desk and handed me an envelope. After saying just two words, You have been served. He quickly turned around and left the bank. Time seemed to stand still when I reluctantly opened the manila envelope, finding its contents inside, a petition for divorce. A wave of fear washed over me, squeezing my chest as if I had had a heart attack. Unfortunately, Luck was not on my side, as the situation was getting worse. The petition was accompanied by a restraining order, effectively depriving me of the opportunity to return to the house I owned before I got married. I was stunned to learn that I was forbidden to communicate with Brianne in order to understand why she wanted a divorce. In court, my four-year-old wife said she feared for her safety if I contacted her. Interestingly, she managed not to mention to the judge that we had had an intimate relationship not once, but twice the previous night. More precisely, I made love to her, and she deceived and betrayed me. Left with only clothes on my back, I had no choice but to seek refuge in my mother's house and humbly ask for my old room. It would be a huge understatement to say that I did not expect such a development. I was a stupid and contented person making plans for our common future. I imagined a future filled with anticipation of a new life in this world and old age next to my closest person. But everything I cherished was suddenly destroyed. The next month was like a chaotic storm of misery. My financial situation was scrutinized, as if I was secretly saving every penny to afford a simple meal. I endured a series of interrogations, each of which was more painful than the previous one, and resembled the depiction of hell in Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy. I had to witness all kinds of torment. Throughout this ordeal, I was constantly tormented by a single question. Why? When your spirit is shattered, your ability to think clearly and make reasonable decisions is undermined. Therefore, I agreed to everything without hesitation. But I had one simple request for my future ex-wife, to answer my only question. Unfortunately, on the day of our court hearing, she did not have the decency to address me directly. Instead, her smooth-talking lawyer handed me a single sheet of typewritten paper, devoid of any personal touches. Surprisingly, this brought me some comfort as it confirmed my innocence. It became obvious that I had done nothing wrong. She had simply reunited with Charles Winston III, her college sweetheart, and self-proclaimed betrothed via Facebook. They looked like modern-day Romeo and Juliet. His father strictly forbade his son to marry Brianna. But fate intervened years later when his father died suddenly of a heart attack. The day after the funeral, the son went in search of his former lover. The following fragment left me completely stunned. I'm divorcing you because I value you highly and would never betray our relationship by having an affair with Charles. I am incredibly lucky that she appreciates me so deeply. Perhaps she managed to completely deprive me of my spirit and callously throw away my lifeless body. In fact, it was. The agonizing tears streaming down my face did not allow me to read any further. Just two days later, our divorce, which neither of us could have been to blame for, was officially finalized. After leaving the courtroom, I went to the bank to apply for my resignation. My ability to think straight was compromised, so I decided to quit my job before I was fired. Now I'm driving aimlessly towards California, with no specific destination in mind. Why California, you ask? Yes, because I have always had a deep desire to see the expanses of the Pacific Ocean. After leaving the house, I went to the Ford dealer where I decided to exchange my Mustang convertible. Instead, I chose a late model pickup truck weighing three quarters of a ton, equipped with a comfortable slide and a camper. While I was away, 
A moving van had already pulled up to my mom's house and delivered six cardboard boxes with all my belongings. It took me a few days to prepare the camper for the upcoming trip around the country because it was supposed to be my home for at least the next year. Despite my mother's attempts to dissuade me, I remained firm in my decision to leave. I explained to her that going on this adventure was extremely important for my survival, but to reassure her, I assured her that I would call regularly to keep in touch. Deciding to avoid the noisy highway, I made a conscious decision to travel west, driving on low traffic roads until my fuel meter came to an end. Curiosity consumed me, and I was looking forward to the mysterious turns that fate had prepared for me. With a clear plan in mind, I intended to get a job that required more physical labor than mental abilities, and limit my stay anywhere to just two weeks. When the sun sank smoothly to the horizon, I arrived in a small town, which welcomed me with open arms. The main street opened up in front of me, decorated with a lonely, dilapidated establishment, masquerading as a bar, where you could also eat. My attention was attracted by a crudely written sign announcing that they needed help. Sitting down in an armchair, I drank a cold beer and started a conversation with the bartender, who also happened to be the owner of the establishment, about the possibility of employment. I informed him that I was just passing by, but I needed to earn some money for gas. He answered anxiously, You can work all day for minimum wage. In return, you will receive food for lunch and dinner as well as any tips but you'll have to pay for the beer yourself. I answered quickly, if you have a place where I can park my camper, I will gladly agree. Just let me know where I can put it on your property. After that, I'll put on this apron and start clearing the tables. That's how I started my new path by applying for this job. On the seventh day of my adventure, I met a woman, maybe a dozen years older than me, but still quite attractive. That evening I had an intimate relationship with only the second woman in my entire life. It was a pleasant experience, to say the least. Staying true to my promise, I left two weeks later. Phil, the owner of the place, handed me an envelope with money and assured me that I could find a job whenever I wanted. Over the next six months I worked in twelve different establishments, including restaurants, snack bars and dive bars, and met many women who sympathized with my story and tried to cheer me up. But then an unforeseen challenge came my way. A harsh winter in the Rocky Mountains. When I drove into an unnamed town in Colorado, the snowfall was so heavy that it blocked my view of the road. It seemed that everyone with a sense of prudence decided to stay in bed to take shelter from the raging storm. Among the gloomy surroundings, the only light source came from the police station. Deciding to find shelter, I parked my car in front of the station and approached the deputy sheriff to explain my predicament. Fortunately, he turned out to be a kind and helpful person and allowed me to park in their parking lot until the roads were cleared. Not only that, he even contacted the restaurant across the street so that I could satisfy my hunger in bad weather. The woman in charge turned out to be elderly with an obvious Italian accent. She looked me over carefully with her eyes. My grandson mentioned that you are trying to take shelter from the storm in a makeshift vehicle, she said. But you look like a decent young man. I have a more comfortable bunk in the storage room. After expressing my gratitude, I devoured the most delicious food I've ever tasted. The next morning, I was awakened from sleep before sunrise by the sounds of Mrs. Villano bustling in the kitchen. Looking out the window, I saw only endless expanses of snow. While I was getting dressed, an impressive stack of paint cans neatly placed against the wall caught my attention. After exchanging pleasantries, I asked about the paint. It was bought by my late husband. May he rest in peace about ten years ago. Strangely enough, he never even tried to use it. On the other hand, I earned my living in college by painting houses, and I was ready to exchange my work for your culinary experience. So an agreement was reached that changed the trajectory of my life. To pay for accommodation and meals, I took on painting the entire restaurant. I also helped in the kitchen during the evening rush. At the end of each day, I stopped my painting work and cleaned myself thoroughly. 
I decided to overcome my culinary curiosity and put on an apron in an effort to master the art of real Italian cuisine. For the next five mornings, I sat on a stepladder and carefully cleaned the stamped tin ceiling and then applied the base color with a brush. A touch of accent color turned the ceiling into a spectacle reminiscent of the magnificent Sistine Chapel. My dear Peter, it looks amazing! You have the talent of an artist! exclaimed a voice full of admiration. The next day, when the roads finally became accessible, a flood of customers poured into the establishment. Their eyes widened in awe as they assessed the efforts put into the ceiling. It is noteworthy that several young ladies also looked in here, fascinated by the artist's skill, and soon I found myself surrounded by a lively circle of friends. Over the next few days, my progress in drawing was hampered as the waitress, Mrs. Villano, did not show up. To ease her worries, I assured her that I had experience working as a waiter and took over the maintenance of the establishment while she managed the kitchen. Our cooperation turned out to be very effective, and we worked as a team. That night I slept deeply and soundly, without any interference. Surprisingly, this is the first time I didn't read Brianna's letter before going to bed. I deliberately chose the word sleep, rather than nap, because a restful sleep would not let me rest. The next morning my sleep was interrupted by the genuine crowing of a rooster. Later I found out that Mrs. Villano had deliberately woken up the rooster. During the quiet period between lunch and dinner, I sat next to her, striving to reveal her hidden talents. Mrs. Villano had a deep passion for singing, especially Italian love songs. Soon she made me join her melodious voice and sing along to her. Moreover, she took the trouble to teach me the art of speaking Italian while she was cooking in her kitchen. Surprisingly, I quickly mastered the language, which allowed us to have conversations in her native language. Although it might be a slight exaggeration to say that we communicated freely, I absorbed her every word, fascinated by her patient nature. The lessons continued to arrive, and with the onset of the spring season, we went on a trip to plant a charming herb garden together. In the autumn season I mastered the art of winemaking and canning. Contrary to my own principles, I extended my stay here for a wonderful 18 months, immersing myself in the culinary arts and even adopting the eloquent speech of my mentor. As the spring sun warmed the day, I finally finished my latest masterpiece on canvas and confessed to Mrs. Villano that it was time for me to embark on a new journey. She graciously replied with a knowing smile. In honor of my departure, a farewell celebration was organized, surpassing in splendor what is usually reserved for triumphant leaders. Among the many gifts Mrs. Villano gave me were a carefully handwritten recipe book and a box filled with her exquisite homemade wine. Hugging me tightly for the last time, she put an envelope with a name and address in my hands. When you get to San Francisco, she instructed, find my cousin Anthony. Tell him that you are the son I have always dreamed of. Intrigued by the prospect of exploration, I decided to embark on a leisurely sightseeing trip along an extended tourist route towards the captivating coast. By the will of fate, I was even lucky in Reno, known as the largest small city in the world, where I managed to save up a few extra dollars. In addition, I made a symbolic gesture by spitting into the vast expanses of the Grand Canyon. A few weeks later, while enjoying a delicious lunch at the Fisherman's Wharf, I was thinking about my recent adventures. The next morning, I arrived at the destination indicated on the envelope, looking forward to discovering the secrets that awaited me ahead. Located among two dozen other charming Italian restaurants, this diner stood out as a real gem. Located in the heart of Knob Hill, it seemed like the ultimate destination for lovers of Italian cuisine. The alluring aroma of the surroundings filled the air, reminding of a heavenly culinary paradise. But as I approached the restaurant, I noticed that it was dimly lit, which gave it a certain mystery. Deciding to enter, I knocked lightly on the door. A moment later, a short, bald gentleman dressed in white cautiously looked out of the kitchen and rudely exclaimed, We are not open. Not calming down, I persistently knocked again, 
This time the door swung open, revealing an impatient man. Curious, he asked, what do you need? Handing him the envelope, I calmly replied, it's high time you got this. Suddenly he spoke in Italian, urgently addressing his boss. A man has arrived who seems to have all the knowledge. Tony looked at the note and burst into uncontrollable laughter. They didn't seem to know about my ability to understand Italian, as Tony continued to read the letter aloud. Surprisingly, my eccentric cousin suggested that I put my kitchen at the disposal of this stranger and let him demonstrate his culinary skills. All the staff burst into fits of laughter and started throwing disparaging remarks, wondering how a man who seems as simple as white bread could cook like one of them. I preferred to keep this revelation to myself. Tony's attention shifted to a huge cardboard box and two bulky shopping bags lying next to me. Curious, he asked, what's he got there, chief? When I got settled in my new place, the employees began to tease me in Italian, as if greeting me. It turned out to be a gift from Mrs. Villano, who handed me the box. Curious, I opened it and found four bottles of her homemade wine. Tony, one of my colleagues, asked for a glass and began uncorking one of the large bottles. He poured just enough to taste, then filled a glass and took a sip. Intrigued, he asked who made this exquisite wine. The bottle went around the whole room, giving everyone the opportunity to try. Mrs. Viano taught me how to make this wine last fall. If my culinary skills matched the quality of this wine, perhaps I would have been accepted as a valuable addition to the team. Tony called his daughters, and then I had the pleasure of meeting Gina and Anna Maria, two exquisite twins with impeccable beauty and luxurious dark hair that seemed straight out of a dream. My words stumbled as I tried to express my delight at meeting them. Anna Maria smiled graciously and replied, it's nice to meet you too. But there was hostility in Gina's gaze and she coldly remarked, So this is a famous chef from Colorado. There was laughter from behind me, and then a mocking voice proclaimed, The legend itself! Ha! He's a legend! A wave of laughter swept through the room. And so, I got my nickname during a special ceremony. Tony, speaking in Italian, said, Okay, let's see what the legend can come up with. Despite my doubts, I believe in my cousin. Tonight, the people of San Francisco will be judging his culinary skills. Gina was looking at me, her eyes full of anger. I understood every word she said. My smile inadvertently revealed my secret. She hurled a barrage of Italian insults at me, but I defended myself in her native language. The kitchen staff watched our heated verbal altercation with awe. In the end, Tony intervened and asked us to leave it for later. Boy, she hissed, looking at my feet. He'll be lucky tomorrow if he just does the dishes. Then she hurled a stream of curses at me, after which she ran away. Tony chuckled and remarked, I think she really likes you. And now let's get to work. You will be responsible for preparing the soup and two specialties for tonight. Picking up my bags filled with an assortment of fragrant herbs and spices, I quietly said a prayer and warmly greeted my devoted staff. That evening the air was filled with the melodious sounds of Italian conversation. It was on this evening that I proudly presented my signature dish, Sapino, a real Italian fisherman's soup soaked in the subtle aroma of freshly caught Dungeness crab. In just an hour all the aspic scallops, shrimps and clams were completely sold out. Soon after, my linguine alla moce, a delicious dish of Dungeness crab caught right within sight of the city, ran out. The highlight of the evening was when the waiter informed me that two customers had almost got into a heated argument over the last portion of my homemade gnocchi with basil pesto. Tony, overwhelmed with joy, came into the kitchen and hugged me tightly. Meanwhile, Marie said that this night marked the birth of a legend. But Gina stayed in her office, diligently keeping financial records. Despite the fact that one of the waiters brought her samples of both dishes, she remained silent. Grateful for this gesture, I expressed my gratitude to everyone in the kitchen, feeling that I had finally found a place that I could call home. The only thing I had to do was introduce music and encourage my team to sing while working. As Mrs. Villano always claimed, 
music can enhance the taste of food. The Winston family made their fortune through real estate, and the patriarch, Charles Winston I, specialized in acquiring confiscated real estate. During the Great Depression, he acquired many farms, although some claim that his methods bordered on theft. After the end of World War II, he set about laying out cornfields and building similar houses that would be funded by the government for returning soldiers, known as GIs. Each house was an exact replica of the others, except for the color of the tiles and shutters. Charles Winston II, Dash, an elderly gentleman who categorically asked not to be called Junior, continued the family legacy by investing in various farms around the city during the difficult period of the OPEC recession in the early 70s. In the late 80s, he waited patiently, watching the real estate market until it reached its peak. A sudden surge in demand led to the appearance of construction trailers, and then to the appearance of standard houses and an influx of funds. Without delay, KV III and Brianna decided to tie the knot. Unfortunately, their honeymoon in a tropical paradise did not go as expected. They both got sick because of an intestinal parasite, which contradicted the promises made in the brochure. The resort quickly denied all responsibility, saying the couple had ignored their warnings against eating from beach vendors. After their return, the confident young man quickly arranged a meeting. With a decisive step, he announced his intention to steer the company in a new direction. Although the era was laudable, it is obvious that the time for caution has passed. Now we are taking a more decisive approach, and immediately. We must actively look for farmers who want to sell their land. Unfortunately, K.V. III did not inherit his father's astute business sense and far-sighted thinking. Instead, he showed traits of narcissism and selfishness, believing that he had superior knowledge compared to everyone else. Unable to restrain himself, he began buying up farmland at inflated prices, ignoring historical precedents. In the 2000th year when the real estate bubble collapsed, he accumulated a significant amount of debt, mortgaging all his property. The Great Recession that followed had a stifling effect on the economy, forcing people to refrain from buying new homes. While others perceived this situation as unpleasant and pulled away, KV, on the contrary, saw an opportunity. Despite the circumstances, he decided to borrow even more money to acquire his largest competitor, as a result of which he got more than 500 vacant acres of land and more than 50 houses that are currently being built. But then he faced a serious problem, the lack of buyers. Despite relentless attempts to sell his stocks using all possible tricks, he was unable to attract a single interested buyer. Due to the receipt of numerous mechanical bills from contractors who were not paid, mail began to accumulate rapidly. Alarmed bankers noticed how sharply the value of their collateral had fallen and urgently contacted the man to demand full payment on his outstanding bills. Despite the difficult situation, the man remained optimistic and believed that he would be able to cope with difficulties. In an attempt to mitigate the consequences, he decided to liquidate all his assets, including a modest portfolio of shares that he inherited. Moreover, he even cashed out his insurance policies. As a last-ditch measure, he resorted to emptying the safe deposit box and retrieved all of his mother's jewelry. Unfortunately, these efforts were not enough to get rid of his creditors for at least a month. On the day when creditors were about to seize his house, he decided to drown his grief in a glass of scotch. With a heavy heart, he took out his father's valuable 12-gauge shotgun from the armory and tragically passed away. Later, the heartbroken family discovered that his coffin would not open during the wake, which aggravated their already incredible suffering. A few minutes before the sheriff's deputy arrived to hand over the eviction papers, Brianna stumbled upon this horrifying scene. She couldn't help but think that this was the most terrible day of her life. She did not know that the future held even more difficulties for her, as the truth about her late husband's financial misdeeds was gradually being revealed. When my sister's wedding day was approaching, she insisted that I fulfill my promise. Although I wanted to attend her wedding, there was an obstacle in my way. 
Brianna, my ex-girlfriend, turned out to be the groom's cousin and was supposed to attend the wedding with her mother. It's been over five years since I last saw her, and I wasn't going to cross paths with her anymore. Despite my reluctance, my sister's determination finally got to me. As a result, I had to take a day off and go to Chicago. By that time, I was working out regularly at the fitness club, and I couldn't deny that I looked amazing in a tuxedo. The limo driver arrived flawlessly. A group of grooms and bridesmaids crowded outside the church, eagerly awaiting the arrival of a traveling brother who had been missing for five years. When I got out of the car, I heard the sounds of an organ. I was accompanied by Gina and Marie, my charming companions for the evening. These stunning twin sisters were dressed in exquisite designer dresses that accentuated their flawless figures. Decorated with thigh-high slits, their outfits revealed elegant lace stockings. A month before that, I informed them that I would not be able to attend the event because I did not have a date. To my surprise, they both kindly offered to accompany me and pretend to be my partner. I jokingly expressed my dilemma, admitting that I love them both equally and can't choose between them. Gina, the slightly older twin, cleverly suggested that I change my card with the answer plus one to plus two. Marie enthusiastically supported the idea, saying it was a unanimous decision. My sister curiously asked who was the third person on my answer card. In response, I playfully suggested that she would have to get married herself to find out the answer. While the wedding party watched in amazement, I proudly led one stunning woman by the hand, guiding them to the family bench of the bride. My mother's expression was absolutely priceless. Oh my God, they looked just great. From the sudden movement, many heads turned sharply, perhaps having received minor neck injuries, as they tried to make out the brother who had been gone for so long, confidently striding to the altar. Flashes from various cameras illuminated the entire scene, capturing the moment from almost all sides. A group of old school friends couldn't contain their delight, and burst into applause and booing as we passed by. Among the crowd, I noticed Brianna sitting next to her mother. Unfortunately, time has not been kind to her appearance. She had gained at least 60 pounds, which was noticeable from her appearance. There was an expression of confusion on her face, and her complexion was pale. Before returning to their role of escort, both of my companions kindly kissed me. When the wedding march started playing in Oregon, we started our march. Denai made an additional request to us. She asked me to make a toast before dinner. Although public speaking has never been my strong suit, I reluctantly agreed to say a few words. Trying to hurriedly write down my thoughts, I struggled forward. But in the midst of my disappointment, an elderly couple sitting alone at the groom's table caught my attention. In the course of further inquiries, I found out that these were the groom's grandparents, who had specially come from Italy for this significant event. It dawned on me that they don't know English at all. At first I felt apprehensive and tried to shift my attention to another place. But their very presence, as they sat side by side and radiated happiness in a room teeming with strangers speaking an incomprehensible language, filled me with awe and inspiration. Myriad scenarios flashed through my head, each of which was more piquant than the previous one. Instead of baffling Brianna and asking her about the till death do us part oath, I chose a more noble approach. Speaking in perfect Italian, I respectfully asked the elderly couple to get up from their seats. I hugged them warmly and invited the entire audience to raise a glass to these wonderful people who have now become an integral part of my own family. The audience burst into applause and I turned to Brad and Wendy urging them to join me on stage. There was silence in the crowd, curiosity filled the air, and everyone wondered about my intentions. Keeping calm, I asked both of them to extend their right arms forward. When our father was on his deathbed, he told my sister to put her hands in mine. Then he carefully wrapped his weakened arms around ours. With what little strength he had left, he squeezed our hands tightly and said, I apologize for not being able to witness the end of your life. 
That's why I'm entrusting this responsibility to your brother, Peter. Peter, you will become Wendy's closest companion, her guiding light and protector. I beg you not to disappoint me. Today I am passing on this sacred duty to your husband, John. John, I'm connecting your soul with Wendy's. From now on, you are inseparable. You will be her confidant, mentor, and guardian. Make room for Gina and Anna Maria, the life of the party. Don't let me down, we need your protection, she urged. The crowd cheered, their enthusiasm filling the room. But amid the jubilant atmosphere, Brianna stood in tears, finding solace in her mother's arms. As the evening went on and we sat down to dinner, a quartet came on stage and performed a medley of songs for us. Although the music wasn't terrible, it lacked exciting vocals, which left much to be desired. Sensing an opportunity, Gina and Anna Maria took my hands and led me around the dance floor, deciding to bring some energy to the performance. They pulled the microphone off the stand without hesitation pushing aside the guitarists and the drummer. Grinning mischievously, Gina challenged the keyboard player to keep up with our impromptu antics. In a moment of high spirits, Gina's voice boomed out of the speakers, and she proudly announced, Ladies and gentlemen, we present to you a legendary performer who has just completed a triumphant three-year performance in San Francisco. The banquet hall exploded with delight. Our rich experience of singing together in a restaurant came in handy when we began a two-hour serenade of heartfelt love songs dedicated to my sister and her newly married husband. The angelic harmony of Gina and Emery fascinated everyone present. To complement the joyful atmosphere, we persuaded the groom's grandfather to perform an incendiary tarantella dance, and the groom gracefully spun his grandmother on the dance floor. Day, standing next to her beaming mother, couldn't contain her happiness. When we finally took a well-deserved break, my ex-mother-in-law came up to me with a friendly look. Peter, can I talk to you for a minute? Good evening, Mrs. Bennington. Brianna was hoping to get a chance to talk to you, but it seems like you were hard to find. She wants to apologize and ask for your forgiveness. Mrs. Bennington, that's not necessary. Mrs. Winston's words have been meaningless to me for many years. Peter, please don't be like that. Just talk to her. I won't do it, but there is something I would like to convey. I rummaged in my wallet and took out a tattered piece of paper. When your daughter divorced me, her lawyer gave me this letter. I must have reread it countless times, although perhaps the tears made it difficult for me to read. But the tears have dried up, and I no longer feel the agony of her betrayal. This letter is the last communication with your daughter. Please take it because now it belongs to you. Excuse me, I have plans with one special person. I left without turning around. 